This is our second in a series of events celebrating the centennial of the right for women to vote in California. Yesterday was the actual day, although when the election happened 100 years ago, no one knew that they had won when they went to bed. It was declared a loss, but the next day, lo and behold, the, the votes were counted, and then actually it was a victory. These events have been hosted. I've just had the most delightful time getting to know some new people well, and they've been members of the Seroptimists, the League of Women Voters, um, AAUW, and help me out, ladies. I'm looking. And oh, of course, and at least the last but not least, and the Benicia Historical Society, and the um, and with some co collaboration with the district. And those ladies are Heather Laughlin, Bonnie Silvera, Sandy Kirkpatrick, Helene Bowles, and Belinda Smith. And is there anybody else? And Carrie Carney, who's not here tonight. So, I'm going to give you a two-minute history of suffrage in the United States. And then we're going to get on with our show because I know you're here this evening to have a great evening uh, prepared for you. The history of women's suffrage in the United States was not an easy one. It took years and years to accomplish. It officially started, I, you'd say, in 1848 with the Seneca, Seneca Falls Convention when they announced, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And with that convention, they put out a platform of rights for women. It wasn't just the right to vote. There were many other rights they were concerned about. The right to divorce, the right to earn your own living, the right to own property. But they, the, women at that, the wise women at that convention realized that if, that was, if they were going to change society, they were going to have to do so by getting the right to vote so that their voice could be heard, so that they could elect officials that represented their, their desires. There was not a lot of activity during the Civil War, but with the passage of the 15th Amendment, when African American males were given the right to vote, there was renewed interest and enthusiasm. There were two schools of thought. One school said, we need to go for full suffrage at the national level. And that's what they worked hard and long for. Another group said, if we're going to change, we're gonna, it's going to happen best by doing it state by state, territory by territory, issue by issue. And so they started out in the West and in Wyoming, I think it was 19, I'm gonna say this wrong, but I think it's 1858, Wyoming became the first territory that allowed women's full suffrage. At the same time that they were working on the territories, they were, um, the suffragists were also working on issues, and it's interesting to me as a school superintendent that in many states, the first one being Kentucky, women got the right to vote partially on school board elections. It was thought at the time, the men at the time thought that that was a logical extension of the women's sphere, and so they could vote in electing school board members and school superintendents. At the same time, in other states, women could run for school board or school superintendency, but they didn't have the right to vote for the candidates. So after Wyoming became the first state, other, states uh, other territories and states followed. The reason it was more popular out west, historians um, surmise, is that those men in power wanted women to move to the western territories. There was a lot more men than there were women. And one of the ways of enticing women to move west was to allow suffrage, uh, the right to vote. And so Colorado, Utah, um, Kansas, and other states followed suit until we get to California. And California proudly was the sixth state to allow voting for women. That didn't go smooth and easily either. Either, In fact, in, I'm going to be loose with my date here, and you're not going to know the difference, I bet, but 18, I think it was 93, or they passed the right to vote in the state legislature, but the governor, oh, I got it right, but the governor vetoed it. And then, and that after that, really, really close, it took years of massive organizing to get, to, to get, to the ballot in 1911. I'm proud of California that it was um, the sixth state in the union and it took nine more years before it was ha it happened nationally. Tonight we have, we're going to hear we have two events. One, in a minute I'll introduce our first speaker, Bonnie Silvera, who's probably not a stranger to anybody. So Bonnie will be speaking first and then we will have 
Mrs. Wright, who was our wonderful middle school drama teacher, and eight girls from Benicia Middle School will be t helping enlighten us about the history of California suffrage and the women, the very important women that played a role in that. So they'll be sharing their, their um, vignettes in a little while. So first we're going to start with Bonnie. And Bonnie, you want to come up while I talk? Sure. Bonnie Silvera is the president of the Benicia Historical Society. Bonnie holds an honor of being a Calif uh, Benicia native, and there's not a lot of Benicia natives, but Bonnie is one of them. And Bonnie, when did your grandfather come? 1918. 1918, so Bonnie's family is a longtime Benician. Bonnie is an example of an empowered woman and a woman that is politically active and has influenced her community. If you think about things that are happening in Benicia, you think about Bonnie Silvera. She's been involved in so many commissions, um, campaigns, both as campaign manager, running campaigns. She's a politically active woman who's been the president of Seroptimus and now is the president of the Historical Society. And um, I've gotten to hear you speak before, and it's always fascinating to find out about our community. Tonight, Bonnie's going to share um, some stories and information about Benicia, women in Benicia. So thank you and welcome. Well, thank you very much. So this has been a fun thing for me, uh, researching uh, women that have run for office in Benicia. Um, I was somewhat taken when I started researching because I remember as a young girl, Olivia O'Grady, she ran for council. She always ran for council, but she never won. And it was just kind of given, and when um, I first started getting involved, my son said to me, Oh, Mom, you're not going to be like Mrs. O'Grady, are you? <laughs> because he knew her as an older woman who had, was very staunch in her beliefs. Um, you know, we've been able to elect council, uh, city clerk, and city treasurer in Benicia since 1850. Now, that's a long time, 161 years. During that time, I'll talk about council and mayor, we've only had 12 women run for office. And out of that, only four women have won council, and two women, the one being the same, our, our mayor now, Elizabeth Patterson, have been, ma been mayor. So you think about that, 161 years, and we've, and it wasn't until 1970, let's see, what, I have that written down. 1972 was the first time a woman ran for, for council. And it was Mary McKay. And Mary McKay was a grand lady. I knew her as a little girl, and then I got to know her as an adult. And she ran because at that time, Benicia was in a very big transition. Benicia, the arsenal had closed. When the arsenal closed, everybody said Benicia was just going to dry up and blow away. Well, it, that didn't happen. Good things happened in Benicia. But one of the things that was being proposed is that our waterfront would become like Oakland with great big ships coming in with big containers all the way down on our waterfront. And Mary McKay didn't want that to happen. And so she got involved and everybody thought, oh, she'll never get elected. Well, she did. And she got that stopped. And the other thing that I remember that Mary really championed for, that the men in this community were just against, were the mediums out on military, the planted mediums. They just thought that was so frivolous. And she just wanted our gateway, because at that time, and that was our gateway into our community, to be welcoming. And so Mary also started our, was one of the founding members of Seroptimus. She, she was a grand lady. After Mary, um, in 19, um, I should have memorized, 1984, Marilyn O'Rourke, who was then a member of the school board. Well, the rumor has it, and Janice probably can remember this, they didn't want her on the school board anymore, so they decided that it would be great if she was our mayor. <laughs> so. <laughs> Marilyn, I've always said, if Marilyn had been a man, they would have a statue of her at the end of First Street. But because Marilyn was a woman, and I, I really hate sounding like this, but it was the truth, 
they said, you know, everything she did, they fought. And we wouldn't be in this library tonight if it wasn't for Marilyn. Marilyn championed to have things go forward, to have this library built. There's, uh, she, she, I can't go, I can go on and on about all the good things she did. And uh, she's, she was great to work with. And I, it was a sad day when she was no longer involved in our political scene. During that time, Marilyn needed some cohorts on the council because she, was, she didn't belong to the boys club. And so she recruited Linda Temple. Linda Temple was a, was a stringer for the Benicia Herald and uh, she worked for other newspapers and she got her to run for council and she got elected but she also got married around that time and her husband got transferred and so she only served for one year. But during that time, Linda and Marilyn gave those guys a run for their money. It made for good council watching. Um, in 1994, Carrie Corbley ran, and uh, she was elected, and she served till 2001. And Carrie was, an, was a tribute to womanhood as she sat on the council. And then in, 19, in 2003, Elizabeth Patterson ran for uh, council and she was elected and then again at in, she served to 2007 and then in 2007 she ran for mayor and she sits in that position today so we've had four elected uh, like i said elected council and elizabeth has served both council and mayor and then elizabeth Marilyn sat as mayor for eight years we've had seven other women run myself being one, and uh, so that only makes 12. Kind of sad, huh? We've had um, six clerks, city clerks, women, and uh, that started in 1941, Anna Pine. And she was city clerk until 1968. Now at that time, we didn't have staff. So actually the city clerk and the city treasurer they paid the bills and they took care of the customers that came in. And City Hall at that time was in the Capitol building. And so when they built the new lot in 1958, the, uh, the city gave back the Capitol to the state of California and the, cap and the uh, city council chambers went over to where Sandoval's is today. And so they were there for a while and then they moved up to where uh, I want to call it uh, Sharoth Winter and Sharoth, the attorneys across the street there. That was the police station for a while, and City Hall was where Sandoval's. And then in 1961, they moved into the where they are today, and that was the high school when I was going to high school. I was we were the last class to graduate out of that building. So we had Anna Pine. And from 1941 to 1968, she was totally dedicated to the city. She never married. And if you wanted to find out anything, you called Anna Pine. After Anna was Betty Pellinen, and she served from 1968 to 1984. After Betty was Fran Greco, and she served from 1984 to 1996. Linda Purdy, 1996 to 2003 and Lisa Wolf from 2003 to the present time. Now the treasurer, the treasurer literally until 1990, she actually wrote out and paid the bills and pay, did the payroll and all of those kind of things. But since we have staff and, this, and our city has grown, it was no longer, <coughs> had no longer uh, been a position where you had to go and work there eight hours a day. But during the time, Elizabeth McKay, now that was Mary McKay's mother-in-law. She was the first woman treasurer, and she was elected in 1940, and she served till 1948. Then Gertrude Brammer. Now, nobody knows anything about Gertrude Brammer. I have asked around, and everybody looks at me that, you know, would know about these things, look at, looks at me and go, who? So I think she was a silent treasurer, did her job, and <laughs> didn't make a lot of waves. 
and she was from 1948 till 1952. Marie Silva, 1952 to 1980. She was a grand lady. I knew Marie personally, and she was very dedicated. And her son, Bob, was our city editor of the paper. He ran the paper, and so he, he, he always had a good sense of humor. And so Marie and Bob were kind of a team in the political scene. <clears throat> Excuse me. Phyllis Garrigus uh, followed Marie Silva from 1980 to 1990. And Phyllis Garrigus was Carrie Corbley's grandmother. So you see a lot of these things are intertwined. So somebody encouraged somebody to do something, right? And then Virginia Souza, Phyllis Garrigus died in office. And Virginia Souza was appointed in 1991 and then ran for the office. And she served until 19, uh, 2007. Teddy Badu was elected in 2007, and she died in office, and she died in 2010, and then Terry Davin was appointed, and she's our present treasurer. So they've, done, they've made a lot of um, strides, but we need more women to be involved, and you young women need to think about how you want to be politically involved, because it's very, very important that we carry on this tradition. The school boards is a little different. It was an all boys men's club until the 19, late 1950s. Emily Koenig, I believe, was the first woman to be elected to the school board. And I was still in school when she was elected. And it was a really a big thing that a woman was going into this men's club. And when I started getting involved, Emily called me one day and she wanted to talk to me about being involved politically. And she told me a story, and I want to share this with you. She was, um, there was a women's club in town that was about, you know, other than church groups for women, the Benicia Women's Club did a lot of good in our community. And the biggest thing they did, Emily was the president, and at that time, Benicia didn't have such, didn't have the reputation that it has today because we had red light district in Benicia, there was prostitution. And when I was your age, when we'd go somewhere and they'd say, where do you live or where are you from? We used to say Vallejo. Now, I know people are always shocked when I tell that story, but Vallejo had a much better reputation at the time than Benicia did. We all knew Benicia was wonderful, but we didn't want them to ask us, you know, well, what are you, a prostitute? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> So Emily Koenig was the president of the women's club and the women's club decided they wanted to shut down prostitution in Benicia. And this was in the 50s. And James Lemus was the mayor and he had a very good relationship. You've all heard the story about how the red light district built the pool, the swimming pool. But Emily knew she would never, she told me, she says, I knew I couldn't get elected to the council. So you know what she did? She got her husband elected. <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't want to run for office, but she talked him into it, and he got elected mayor, and they shut down prostitution in Benicia. And that was a, a good thing, and whenever I think of Emily, I think of that story, because she said, you can do it. You don't always have to be out in the front, but you can get things done. And I think that she made quite an, an impression on myself, because that's kind of been my mantra for some time. The school board, like I said, is different in the sense that it has had a lot of women elected. And I'm sorry that I don't have all their names here, but I ran out of time when I kind of waited till the last minute to do my due dil diligence. There have been times when it's just been a woman school board. And uh, they've been, they've done wonderful things over the years. Sometimes with very little money, they've been able to scrape things together and keep our schools going. And we have such wonderful schools today. It wasn't always like that when I was young. The schools weren't that good in Benicia, but over the years they've become a wonderful schools. And I attribute it to the wonderful uh, administration and the, and the school boards working together to make that happen. So um, that's I was, I, oh, I know what I wanted to tell you before I wind up here. 
I wanted to tell you about elections in Benicia when I was young because they were just a grand thing. You know, they didn't have television then, and so everybody would go downtown, and you know where the paper office is. It was still, it was, that's about the only thing on First Street that still is the same thing as it was when I was a kid. And the paper office would be the central point where you went to find out about elections, and they'd close off the street on each end at H and I, and everybody would be there. And it was like a big block party. And every once in a while, somebody would come and slap up the vote count, I guess they'd call up to Fairfield, and they'd slap the numbers up in the window, and that's how we'd find out but you never ever got to know who won by the end of the night because you know they had to do the other voting, you know, the other counting. It wasn't as sophisticated as it is today because they were doing it by hand. So you always had to wait till the next day to read it in the paper. And as I've grown older, I kind of think that might have been some way for them to sell papers. They probably really <laughs> knew, but you know, they were waiting. So does anybody have any questions about anything about Venetia or about what's gone on in the past, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk with you or um, we're always looking for people to join our society. I've got to give a little plug for the society. You know, there's two, I don't want to mix people up, but there's two things in Benicia. There's the Benicia Historical Museum, which is out, what used to be called the Camel Barn, and then there's the Benicia Historical Society. So there's two things in town that you can join and we love to keep our history alive. And so thank you for inviting me tonight, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you.